Welcome back to Mortuary Mayhem, a podcast by funeral service professionals for funeral service professionals, where any day above ground is a good one. Welcome back, folks. Today, I want to talk about going the extra mile. Setting yourself apart from the others. Now, when I first say that, every industry, something different is going to come to mind, right? And for funeral, the first thing that came to every one of your minds is, I'm going to have a tent over every grave. When it's raining or snowing or even the sun is shining, I'm going to have an umbrella over every family member. I'm going to have the limo go to their house with breakfast and set up an entire buffet in their kitchen so that they can eat while they get ready and then they're fed. And my limo driver will sit for as long as he needs out in that limo and wait for them to be ready. These are all things going the extra mile. I'm going to have all my men and women dressing the same. They're going to look crisp and professional, right? We all look, we all look the same and we you know, give them that impression of 1950s funeral home. The aftercare. Calling the family after the funeral. Making sure everything is good, that they're taken care of. Calling them on the holidays and on the anniversary of the death. On the decedent's birthday. So this is all aftercare. And this is all having support groups and having all of this. And this is all going the extra mile, right? We've all been there. We've all done it. And we all maybe do something a little different. But then I sat down and I started looking and saying, where do we go wrong? How can we fix our problems, right? We all go the extra mile, but we go within the extra mile in a compartmentalized form, right? We look and we do this within our funeral homes. How is my funeral home doing better than the others? But do we look outside of that? And one of the biggest things I notice is that we're busy. We're it's a busy profession, right? We're very busy people. Do we how often do we actually leave our funeral home and do we look at others? And if we look at others, maybe we're looking within our own group. How do we determine that we're the best embalmer, right? We all, you know, it's every conference you joke and say, you know, everyone always says I'm the best embalmer because so many people say it, right? But how do we know that our embalming is good? How do we know? What are we comparing ourselves to? And how do we know that our funerals are good? Are we only looking at our own and saying, wow, I'm proud of myself? Or are we going out? And I find that it really is hard. And again, we're busy. And, you know, in many cases, maybe we don't want competition walking in our door and observing our funerals watching. But either we're going to grow as a profession or we're going to sink as a profession. So we really do need to help each other. Because when you go down the street to the competitor's funeral home and they do something wrong, it reflects on every one of us. When you go down there, when that family goes down there and their bad experience sets the tone for our entire industry, it sets the tone, doesn't matter where they're going to go after that, they're going to choose what they want. Do they want an open casket? Do they want the casket closed? Do they want a cremation? Do they want their urn up front? And their assumption is they're going to come in, they're going to sit down with you and you say, well, this is what I can do. No, no, no. We're going to do this because I've seen I've seen how things are done in the past. You didn't see how I did it. You saw how somebody else did it, but you didn't see how I do it. So we do need to work as a profession to grow and we do need public outreach. We do need that public relations in the form of ensuring that everybody is doing a good job because, again, doesn't matter where that family goes, it reflects on everybody else. Now, something when, when you say go the extra mile to me, I may think things a little different, right? I'm thinking about all those things within the funeral home. Taking that extra time with the decedent when we're embalming and restoring and cosmetics and doing that extra time with the family to check in on them after care. Uh, yes, I want my employees to dress properly and professionally. I do want my families to get fed in the morning. Uh, my limo driver will sit there. I'm going to make sure that everything at the cemetery is, is good if I have to roll out a carpet so that they don't walk in mucky 
muddy ground, I will do that. I will roll out that carpet and wash that carpet later. So these are all things that I would do. But one of those things, one of the most important things that I find that we could do is to continue learning and to go do the extra stuff. Okay, And the extra stuff isn't necessarily in the funeral home. That extra stuff is in the community. That extra stuff is talking to people in the community, talking to senior centers. And yes, we can use that as a marketing technique and we can use that as a way to get pre-need sales. And that all does tie in, right? People see your name, whether or not, you know, you're not maybe not pushing your name at the at when you're talking, but people do come back and you do benefit from these. But more than anything, it is talking uh, to our community. It's serving our community and being a member of your community because people do, you know, again, that does come back and you're not going to, you will reap the benefits of your work because people do remember you, they get to know you and they're going to go to uh, where they know you. But this also goes to education and learning. This Things do change. Things continue to change. And you need to keep up on the latest and the greatest. This past week was the National Funeral Directors Association. I wish I had got to go uh, their national conference. I wish I had gotten to go out to Las, uh, Las Vegas this week. I didn't, unfortunately. I know I'm kicking myself over that, but um, I had other commitments here with the college. I couldn't really abandon my students, unfortunately, in their second week. It just wouldn't have been uh, fair to them. But hopefully I'll be there next year when it's back at its normal time. But things like that, that the the C in the seminars, bringing the greatest, the best, the greatest, and the latest into one place for you to see. Taking advantage of your state associations when they have conferences and they have speeches and they bring people in. Uh, Your local colleges, wherever you be, there's usually a mortuary college nearby or college, even if there's no uh, funeral service program there. There's still a way, there's seminars that go on and, you know, it may not be funeral related, maybe it's business related or science based, but taking advantage of these extra seminars and these extra opportunities that these um, resources bring in. Now, I looked at this and I said, where, where are we going wrong with this, right? This is where I'm going to keep going back to. Where are we going wrong? And I said, why do we not get, why is this profession not getting a lot of people attending, right? And you look and say, well, Dan, I was in this room and there was a couple hundred people. Yeah. But if you pull up your state licensure of licensees, apprentices, um, you know, allied uh, people within the profession as well. And you have thousands within each state, most states, right? Depends on the state that you're in. But, you know, your average size state's going to have thousands of people that are are licensed or associated in some way. And why are we not filling these rooms? Because when I talk to the apprentices, right? Because this is where things start off. And this is where your level of what do I do? And this sets the pace, right? What an apprentice does and what a student does sets the pace for the rest of their career as to what kind of funeral director or embalmer they're going to be. So I asked him, I said, why are you not going to these seminars? Why why aren't you going to be there? And some of it's financial. Hey, look, I got to support a family. I'm not making money. Um, You know, whether it is that they're serving coffee or whether they're working at a funeral home, uh, they have a family to support. So yes, there was a financial aspect to that as well. A big part of that is time. So they're not given the time off. So w- w- I look and say, well, can we get that time? Nope, my boss is going to go, my other colleagues are going to go, so I have to hold down the fort. And respectfully, that is that is a tone that you get, and uh, that is your rank. That it, it, it's, We've all been there, right? So the apprentice stays, the apprentice holds down the fort, and can do various tasks while others can go to these seminars. And I respect that. But what we need to do is make sure that that doesn't set the tone for the future career of, well, this is what I always do, this is my place, and they never get involved when possible because that's going to set later on when they are a director, a embalmer, embalmer, they're not thinking about because they've never been introduced to doing that. So when we can get our apprentices, when we can get our assistants, when we can get our staff out there and at these events, uh, there's a huge benefit and 
to introduce them earlier on. And another thing I saw was a false sense of security. That false sense of security comes in the form of, I talk to these apprentices and I say, hey, look, you're going to want to meet people. Um, we have these career events, career and resource events. We have all of these networking events. You're going to want to meet people. And the answer I get is, nope, I'm good. I know the people at my funeral home. I have a job. I'm good. Um, and they and they're not, you know, this is not going for everybody. I've seen apprentices that are very, very involved, and I commend that. But I overall, I do see this as a prominent uh, answer that I get is that it's a false sense of security of, well, I have a job. I don't need to talk to others. I don't need to talk to the other funeral homes. I don't need to talk to these other employers. I don't need to get to know. And um, it, it goes beyond that. It really does. So the part of that is that I always tell them, I said, well, one, you never know what's going to happen later on, right? You're your owner, your funeral director decides to sell out, and maybe you are, or maybe you're not part of the package deal that goes. Uh, maybe once your apprenticeship is done, you think that you have a job, but they don't have it. They have a space for another apprentice now that you're that you finished, but maybe they don't have a space for another embalmer or director. Those spaces are filled, and you are looking for another job. It's good to know people. But what happens when you need something? Right. What happens when you need help with something? I have an absolute train wreck come in, and I need a good embalmer. So if you've only been within your walls of your funeral home, and you go out and you do your services, and yes, you meet a few people around town, but for the most part, do you know the best embalmers around? Do you know the best funeral directors around when you're busy? What happens when you want to go on a vacation? You're son or daughter is getting married and you need to go for that a wedding, right? You're not going to miss that. That's a major family event. And maybe you are at a small funeral home. You don't have a lot of staff that could cover for you or you have staff that is going to go as well because everyone's kind of family in that aspect. So you're all going to be there. And it's very hard to shut down the funeral home. We, unfortunately, we do. We run like a... uh, uh, there's a couple things. Chinese restaurants run like that family structure as well. There's a couple other industries, you know, if you're in healthcare, healthcare doesn't shut down, but they have shift work. And we don't, we just don't shut down. Um, some funeral homes have implemented shifts and days off and things like that, and that's great. Uh, but overall, the bigger picture is that, especially with the privately owned, the corporates tend to have more time off, uh, we've seen, uh, whereas the privates, unfortunately, um, are short-staffed and are going to work with the structure that they have. We all know that. So what are you going to do when you want to take that day off or you want that vacation? And there are a couple options of bringing in locum tenant uh, funeral directors to your area that can help you out, calling a friend, but you need those friends. And so it's very important to take advantage of these opportunities, meet people, get out there. And when you need a friend, you know who to call, you know who you can rely on, you know who can do the job, and you have somebody. So that it's it's very vital. And I stress that to all my students is don't get comfortable in the setting that you're in. Get to know people because when you need something, you're going to need it quick uh, and you're going to need that help. Now, the other thing is growing. Growing within your profession. And that's taking the opportunity to, again, go to conferences, go to these seminars, go to these things and get these visuals, get this extra learning. Um, Don't get stagnant because, again, you're never going to grow as a profession if all you do is get stagnant within. So we do need to take advantage of these opportunities. And the NFDA brings out a lot of great things. Uh, They have, um, have, uh, sorry, a ranger training. Uh, They have crematory operator training. Kena runs that as well. The ICCFA runs that. Uh, Insight runs the... Um, celebrant training. We have your local associations. We have the national conference. We have all of these things. Again, colleges run uh, various things as well. They have various speakers that can come out. So again, take advantage of all of that. But one thing um, that I also stress with these students that I've noticed is that all of these things that you do will show up on your resume. And this does come back to, again, that false sense of security with your job, uh, this comes back to maybe the structure of the employment uh, setting that you're in as to 
well, you know, I don't, I have that. I'm just going to keep moving along. So, but you do need to still think about resumes. You still need that. You don't forget, don't forget that major aspect of um, representing yourself. But a big part of getting involved is the things that you get nominated for and the things that you will be provided by being known. And when we're looking at students, there's a lot of scholarships that come up, whether that be for your academic degree, and we have scholarships for various events uh, that where you can go out to some of these conferences on scholarships, you can go out to some of these seminars on scholarships, uh, and a lot of the, or other opportunities, right, going to various things or being presented with the resources of something really do come with who do you know. Uh, and part of that is if you're out there, you're shaking hands, uh, if you're being seen, when somebody's thinking and says, hey, I have this opportunity, your vendors are going to think about you when they have something, right? Hey, I have a product and I would love to see someone try this. You're going to get that product and you're going to get to test it out. When you're dealing with your college professors, the same thing matters, right? They're handed the opportunity when an employer comes, and there's different ways to get jobs in this industry. The least likely is going to be to use uh, things like Monster or Indeed or any of those. Okay, Yes, there are jobs that are posted on there, and some funeral homes do use that. And mostly you're going to see the corporates or some other funeral homes that are larger are going to put feeler ads out. There may or may not be an actual job tied to that a lot of times. Um, they do have sometimes tied, but in many cases, those are feelers because there's always a opening at some of these larger firms and they're going to see who is and, you know, if somebody does show up that is worthy enough of their employment, then they will snag that individual and create a seat for them. But it doesn't mean that they're trying to fill a seat that is vacant at this moment and uh, that they're in a rush to do it. The most common place for employers in this industry to get employees is two ways. One is word of mouth and knowing somebody. So knowing somebody, knowing where they are, knowing how they work, and grabbing them and saying, hey, what can I do to convince you to come down the street to me and work for me? That is one of the number one ways to get a licensed funeral director or embalmer in this industry. And the number one way to get apprentices and also get recent graduates is through the schools. Your mortuary programs, your funeral service programs at the accredited colleges are the number one way that employees are handed to employers. The employers reach out to your schools, uh, reach out to these schools, and they sometimes will ask for ads and they'll say, okay, can you push an ad out to your students? Can you push them out to your recent graduates? Can you push them out any way that you have? Is there a place I can post this? And they'll announce that there's an actual opening at their funeral home. The majority do not want that. The majority will want it to be uh, concealed. They do not want to admit that there's an opening because they don't want to be flooded. They don't want people knocking on their doors. And uh, one concern is we are a close-knit industry, and if you have people knocking on your door, there's a lot of heart feelings over, you know, why didn't somebody else get the job if they applied? So they don't want that. What they're going to want is hand-delivered names. They want to say, Professor, who would you hire if you were to hire your students? That's what they want. They want the professors to hand deliver them students that they know are one, employable, two, looking for a job, and three, are going to fit the mold of their funeral home. They can say, I'm looking for someone that's going to be able to do this. And there's a long list, and I'm not going to get into what they're looking for um, specifically, but we do get the same, we tend to get the same requests each time uh, from these employers. And that's exactly what we do. We hand deliver these names to these employers. And who do we choose? We're going to choose the students that we know. I'm going to go through how many names, and I'm going to hand pick those names and say, I know the student comes to class, but that's all I can tell you. They show up, they disappear. Sometimes they show up late, sometimes they show up on time, but but they're in class. And... 
It's the students that stay after class. Not annoy us. Don't bug us. Don't be don't be a thorn in our side. We don't like that. That's not going to get you anywhere either because then now, you, now you're definitely not recommended for the job. But be the student that stays after class, asks good questions. Be the student that stays after class and talks to your colleagues, your classmates, okay, those that are around you, your professors and your classmates. Talk to those colleagues of yours and have meaningful conversations. Be the student that stays after and looks at the anatomical models in the lab and studies the anatomy and plays with the instruments in the cart in the prep room and tries to learn what they're used for. Be that student that inquires how to get involved, that student that does get involved. Be that student that helps out when something needs to be moved. We need to move stuff around the department. Be that student that helps, that stays and helps. Doesn't run off. Nothing else is more important in that world than helping around the department. When we do events, when we bring things in like a ranger training, celebrant training, uh, cre- crematory operator training, or you know, we bring in these guest speakers from the uh, organ donation center, the organ banks, or the cemetery or crematory or any of these things, be the student that's there. Even if it's not during class time, be the student that comes in on those extra days and does that. When we do a party or we do an event or we do be the students that's there. When we have our pinning ceremony or we do the Pi Sigma Eta induction, be the student that's there to help set everything up and be there the one that takes everything down. Because we're making mental notes. And when something comes up and there is an opportunity... It's not that we're picking these students and we're playing favorites, because we are, but, I mean, we don't want to admit to it, no. (laughs) Um, No, but we're not. We're not. It's not that we're playing favorites in these ways. What we are is we're turning to the students that we know we can rely on. And the same thing goes after you're graduating. Once you graduate, everybody in this industry is going to turn to the people that they can rely on. So when an opportunity comes up and... We need somebody to teach a course. We need somebody for a job. There's a job opening. What we're going to do is we're going to call the or we need an embalming done or an extra funeral. We need extra hands. We're going to call the person that we can rely on. The person that we know that when we call, they say, let me make it happen. Or the student that we know is always or the or the funeral director that's out there, embalmer that's out there, that is always partaking in these extra events, and we say, hey, look, I got an opportunity, I got a free ticket, a free scholarship, a free something, to get somebody to that event, and I can make nominations for this award, I can make nominations for this scholarship, and I've been tasked with nominating who I think would be the best fit. And I can give one name, I can give multiple names. And in that, giving in that task, who am I going to choose? I'm going to choose the person that I know is not going to turn that down, not the person that's going to accept it and say, oh, thank you, and then never book their airline. I'm not going to pick the person that's going to say thank you and then never take that opportunity. Or I'm not going to choose that person that's going to get there and make us look like fools. I'm going to choose the person that's going to go there and make us look good. Okay, That's the person. The person that's going to stand at the podium and accept that reward that is going to make us look good. Good. Now, looking at the market, and I do teach in person, I teach via Zoom, and I teach completely online. So I've, and I've spent my entire career uh, doing that. I've, I started my career teaching on the continuing education circuit. That is how I started out uh, in my educational uh, career. I then taught in person. Then I Also started teaching online. Uh, I adjunct, you know, in addition to my full-time job as well. So I I adjunct for online, uh, completely online programs. I teach high flex where I have half the students in person and half the students uh, in the classroom. And I continue to this day teaching uh, by all three modalities. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. Okay? Online students, I may remember names. Um, I've had students see me at a conference. I've had students, uh, in the online modalities. I've had students on the zoom modalities too, zoom and online, both remote uh, modalities that I've seen these students 
I know names. Uh, I don't know faces. Okay, your picture, if you do have a picture attached to it, it's this tiny, tiny little thing, and when I blow it up, for the most part, I'm not going to really say anything. I'm not sitting there Facebooking everybody and Instagramming everybody. It's just not reality. So, do I know your name? Yes. And unless something really stands out, there are certain names that were always in attendance. You're always asking questions, good questions, students that, you know, maybe sent me something and said, hey, you'd love this, and, you know, went that extra mile. I may remember your name, but for the most part, over the years, your fa- your name tends to fade. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but your name does tend to fade from my mind. And I'll see you at a conference, and you're like, hey, professor, professor, you know, and I'm like, you know, who the, who the, who the heck is this person? <laughs> so um, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm very blunt, and I'm very honest. So, you know, who the heck is this person? And they'll introduce themselves, and I'm like, hey, that name sounds familiar, but I don't remember from where. <laughs> it's because you're a name on paper, and I do grade things, and I'm looking, and, you know, but you are. You're just a name. Uh, you don't make a meaningful impact uh, by being completely in an online modality. You get through your education, and for many, that is a requirement because you are working in places that may be three or four hours from a college or an aircraft, you know, an air a flight from a college, and those areas do have to be served drastically by these online modalities, these remote modalities. Um, and I have a lot of respect for that. As I said, I do teach by those modalities, and there's definitely a place for them. But my point with that is make sure you find the ways to make yourself known. Go to these conferences when you can uh, – Find a way to contribute. Find a way to be known um, and find a way to get to know your professors in other ways or get to know your colleagues in other ways so you're not secluded to just your small little area. Uh, if it's just you and the owner, leave those walls. Get to know people well outside the area uh, because it will be to your benefit because your classmates are under the same thing, right? You're maybe working together. Maybe you're making discussions. Hey, great post. I agree with you. And that's not a good post, by the way. Um, You need to have better replies for those things. But uh, unless you are making study groups and you guys are meeting up by Zoom and you're having bigger pictures to look at, you may make an impact with a few people. Those students that are in person, those students that are physically in a classroom in person are at always going to be a much higher advantage, a much greater advantage than those that are in distant modalities for the simple reason that you're in the same place. I've seen a lot of pictures and then all of a sudden I meet somebody in person and they don't look anything like their picture. So when you see somebody in person, you can pick somebody out from a photograph. I was looking at the NFDA uh, conference pictures from this past week and I'm looking through going, wow, it's amazing how many people... I know in these photos. And it's not that they know me. <laughs> it does That's not what I'm saying. But I know who they are because the people in the audience stood out to me because I know their name. And I know who they are, which means something. Because those people at the conferences are there because they chose to be. And I can pick them out. Not everybody. There's a lot of people in the in the crowd that I could never pick out. But I can always pick out a good handful. And... There's always a decent handful in the group in every picture that I've stood in the same room with, that I've shooken hands with, that I know personally, and that I could call or text in an instant, and they know exactly who I am. Uh, We can have a great conversation, and some of them in the photos, we do have conversations on a a very frequent basis, uh, so we do have that, you know, rapport, right? That is where you want to be. You want to be where you can have a conversation with somebody that's on the other coast, uh, and ask them questions. And that's exactly what you do. Knowing these people, and when you're sitting in the same room with them, whether it be through these conferences or, again, going to college in person where you are sitting next to somebody, you're grabbing coffee with them between classes, you're you know, grabbing lunch, whatever the case may be, you're already there for the events, you're having the conversations when somebody comes in and they are talking about life and they're talking about their week, you're part of that conversation. When they're showing pictures of their kid or their grandkid, you're part of that conversation. Um, you know, shutting off your camera and leaving when you leave class doesn't have that same effect. It's after that that the professors and the students are now having this dynamic conversation 
outside the classroom about life. That's when the questions about the difficult embalmings and the difficult funerals come up. And that's when you learn from those experiences to say, wow, if I ever come in contact with that, I now know what to do because you learn from somebody else and their mistakes. But the other thing is getting references. So when it comes to giving reference letters and your employers uh, make write references, but I know that a lot of you are maybe not telling, some of them I hope you are telling your employer and you're getting good reference letters and you're moving up in your profession. But I know that's not a reality and there's many cases where you're not going to get a reference from your employer because you're not admitting to your employer that you are leaving until you get the new job. And I, I, I do, I respect that. Um, you know, I wish you could be able to tell your employer, but I know that's not reality in all situations. But the one place that most people are going to turn to get a reference letter, especially as they're graduating the program and they're looking for their first jobs or they're looking for scholarships to get through school um, or you're looking to go on for an advanced degree. I have students that are going on for masters and doctorates out of my program, which is incredible and, and amazing. And I I love my heart my heart just loves that when I when I get to write those reference letters for medical school or PA school or um, you know nursing school or you know pathology programs forensic programs I just love that because that means my students are looking for the next level now we'd love to fill spaces within our industry and we do that we have a lot of students that are going into that but I do love that when the students are going to law school and all these other things because that means that they're adding extra to that where they can come back and they could serve families with that or they could do a allied part of our profession uh, and they can build from there. But let me tell you, when I'm writing these reference letters, no matter what that reference is for, the most valuable thing is to know the student. And when a student is in person, when that student has sat in my office, when that student has been in the classroom, you know, when I'm pouring coffee for them from their coffee maker between classes and you get to know that student, and when we have events, again, I mention them. You know, when you go to these, when I go to these conferences, when we bring in all these seminars to the college or, you know, to the local area, the the practitioners and the students that are there are the ones that get the best reference letters. I have trouble. I try to keep it to one page. I'm not always good at that, but it's hard. It's really, really hard for some of these students because you have. So many good things you want to say. So many things about how great they are that it's really hard to keep it concise and keep it down to a well-polished reference letter. And then you get the students that come in and you're like, I don't know, the student showed up to class. They've been here, they've been there, but or the practitioner, the same thing, right? I don't know, they're, they're only there when I uh, have something to offer them, right? They're only, they're only there when, when we put the food out. Those are the people that when they ask for a reference letter, either you sit there saying, well, I don't have enough to say, or you, know, you do get the ones, of course, that you're like, hey, look, I can only write good things on this reference letter as well. Uh, and unfortunately, that puts you at a disadvantage because in both cases, if I can only write good things on a reference letter, and yes, we can, there's always those long standing you know, things that can write on, every industry writes in a reference letter. You know, if it wasn't for Dan, you know, we wouldn't have a social hour around the water cooler. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for Dan, you know, the walls in this office wouldn't stand upright. You know, in other words, he's leaning on them too often. So things like that are little things that can be thrown into reference letters, you know, in a positive way that we always joke about, you know, like, oh, goodness, um, you know, it's your hint. But for the most part, we're not going to write negative things in a reference letter. You're never going to get a bad reference letter. But you're going to get reference letters that are the basics, and you're going to get reference letters that just blow you away as far as how great you are. And that's what that's what people are looking for. When you get that reference letter that just blows you away because the person just can't come, you know, just can't get everything onto one page that they have to say about how great you are, that stands out. Because you are horrible 
or the person doesn't have enough to write about you because they don't know you other than the fact that maybe you were a student in the program and yeah, you did okay. But you weren't there for the cemetery tour. You weren't there for the crematory tour. You were not there when we did a ranger training, celebrant training, um, crematory operator training. You weren't there for all you know for all these major events, these social hours, these get-togethers, these conferences, these everything. You weren't there to help. You weren't there to attend, and you weren't the student that drove three hours each way to get to clinical because you said that clinical site professor and I had a student that did this and trust me that reference letter was amazing why because the student in general was amazing that student said look I know that this place three hours from my house is doing better cases and getting better embalmings and a better educational opportunity than any other the other preceptor sites I want to go there and I turned and I said, you sure about that? I got sites, uh, numerous sites closer to you. Nope, that's where I want to go. That's where my friends are going. That's where I want to go because I want to learn. And you know what? That student did it. That student slept in their car. That student slept in, you know, found people in the dorm rooms. Uh, that was, the dorms were, the college was an hour north of the funeral home that I'm talking about. And that student would drive an hour north, stay in the dorms, and then go to class the next morning before driving home the rest of the way. So these things are things that stand out to a professor, stand out to an employer, stand out that when when these students need reference letters for scholarships, they get the scholarship. They get into grad school. They get into these jobs because there are so many things to say about them. But when you don't have a lot to say about somebody because... Again, you were an online or remote student, or when, or if you're in person, you just kind of show up to class. You don't say anything. Maybe you answer a few questions, and then you, you leave. That doesn't make a lasting impression. Um, one, now I have to try to figure out who you are if you're remote, and I'm like, I don't even know. I've never actually met this person. So now you're scrounging emails. or like, I don't know. Let me figure out if I can think about something to write about this person. And most times you can't, other than, hey, I need to register for class, or, hey, I have an excuse of why I need to, I can't show up to class, or, uh, you know, here's my homework. Sorry, it's late. But even if you have somebody that had stuff that was late, but they were there, and they were part of it, and you know why, and it's not just like, well, poor me, I have this whole life behind me. You know, that's great, but if I see the extra effort, that's going to go so much further than, you know, all of the excuses, right? So if you have excuses, but you say, let me make it happen, those are the things that stand out, and that's the things I'm going to write on the reference letter that says, this person, despite all odds and anything thrown at them, makes things happen. They will overcome all odds. That's something I can write. But if you have nothing to write or you have uh, nothing because I don't know you or there's or or you're a horrible, you know, person um, and I can't write and there's nothing nice to write about you, you're about to get the same reference letter. So what I really feel bad because about, again, in either case, I'm not writing very much, very minimal. So the way I want you to think about this is if you're, if you're that, if you're a good person and you're worthy of a good reference letter, show up. Showing up is half the battle. Just being there and showing up and being part of things and doing the extra stuff, being there for the extra will now give you the opportunity to stand out and give you the opportunity to now be a part and will give you the opportunity to to have a different re- different reference letter than the person that were given the bare minimum because um because we didn't want to write the reference in the first place and i and i feel bad saying that but that's the reality okay so showing up is half the battle um and again you know, again, I teach for these remote modalities as well, but it does put you at a disadvantage. So if you are in those, you're going to have to go even further. You're going to have to do the extra mile in order to get to know people um, to overcome that. So that's my big rec- recommendation on that. But again, that's going to, again, these opportunities, these scholarships, these resumes, just, I mean, it all 
just gives you that extra. And you never know what you're going to need. Never get a false sense of security and say, ah, I got a great job. Um, generations retire. New bosses come in. Places get sold. Uh, you finish your apprenticeship or there's a point where, you know, you just decide to go somewhere else. You're going to want people to know you. And you're going to need a good reputation. You're going to want people to know um you're going to want that case where someone says, hey, I went to school with them. I love when you go to that. You go to the seminars and they're like, oh, yeah, I went to school with so-and-so. Uh, that person, my my lab partner, and that's how I got my my job, my apprenticeship as well, was that my, um, my lab partner in restorative art was about to marry my future boss. So she says, hey, you're from such and such an area. Would you, you know, maybe I can talk to my future husband. And that's how I got. That's how that's how I got set up. It's all about knowing people. It's about connections. It's about making a good impression. Um, you know, I know a lot of people that want to come out and they want to be a trade embalmer. Uh, you know, we don't tend to see that too much with the fun- you know funeral side of things. It's more the embalming side where you get trade embalmers. But um, you can do trade anything. Trade pre needs. Trade. Uh, so that is the funeral acting side. Pre- trade pre needs. Trade embalming. Trade everything. But to get somebody to call you in, you're going to need to make a huge impression. You're going, if all you take is somebody to tell somebody else and say, ah, he's a horrible embalmer, you know, he doesn't know what he's doing, and now nobody's going to hire you. And the big thing is they're going to want somebody, you may be a horrible embalmer, but somehow people still hire fluid pushers simply because they went to school with them or they know them and they've known them for 30 years. So, again, you're improve your skills. That's the number one. I don't want to see any fluid pushers out there. Again, improve your skills. Uh, but the bigger thing is how you get that job in the first place is knowing people. Um, they are going to call a friend and that usually does open the doors to them continuing to call you back. And then someone says, Hey, I'm in dire need. I need help. Who do you use? And then they give your name. Uh, and then your name gets out there and out there and out there. And, um, you know, it goes from there. Um, on that note, if you haven't signed up, uh, there's still time. The deadline to register it for the arranger training coming to Bridgewater, Mass, is September 22nd. So that is, from the point this recording is going out, that is in only a few days. This is um, going to be this Friday. So if you have not signed up for the arranger training on September 29th of 2023, you are going to want to sign up. ASAP. This is very, um, there's a great way to get out there. It's coming here to Bridgewater, Massachusetts, and this it's going to be the full eight hours. You get continuing education. Seriously, put down your work, schedule things around it. You got plenty of time to do that. We got about two weeks um, to schedule everything uh, out. Uh, make sure you don't have any services on that day and be there. Th- I can't stress this enough. It's going to be a great training. You're going to grab so much out of this training. Uh, no matter how many years you've been doing arrangements, there's just so much more to learn. Um, Melissa Luce is absolutely my, you know, amazing. She's absolutely amazing with this, um, and she's going to bring a lot to the table and help you improve in things that you can bring back to your firm uh, to be uh, to improve, to be better. Uh, again, September 29, 2023, here in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Go to nfda.org backslash arranger training. Uh, and you will see all of the Arranger Training offerings. I know there's a couple of them uh, listed on there. Grab one. Um, I'm hoping it's the Bridgewater one, but uh, that's the one we are hosting. But other than that, um, they're all good. So I hope you sign up for those. And if you have any questions, concerns, check out our resources on mortuarymayhem.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mortuary Mayhem. For links to information discussed during this episode, please visit the website at www.mortuarymayhem.com. Do you have questions, comments, suggestions for topics, or want to be a guest on the show? Email us at podcast at mortuarymayhem.com. We should do this again sometime. Sometime.